speaker is uh, Luis Alexandre Casanovas Blanco, an architect, curator, and scholar, and currently a PhD candidate at Princeton University. Among many other curatorial appointments, he was the chief curator at the Oslo Architecture Triennale in 2016. Uh, his writings have appeared in publications such as Volume, Movement Research Performance Journal, ARPA Journal, and Plot. Casanovas is the recipient of the La Caixa for Fellowship for Postgraduate Studies and a Fine Arts Grant from the Graham Foundation for the Advanced Study of the Arts. Luis. Thanks, uh, Todd, for the presentation, and thank you, Ashley, for, for the invitation. It's, it's great to be part of this lineup today. Okay. So during the debates preceding the Brexit referendum, the video of a hooded British individual attempting to burn the European Union flag went viral. <laughs> After a speech accusing the European Union of taking away, quote, our British nationality, our identity, our free speech, and our sovereignty, end quote, the individual in the video approaches the starfield blue flag with a cigarette lighter. Their action, however, produces no evident result. The piece of fabric manufactured following European Union regulations on flammable materials does not light. After two minutes trying, the hooded individual gives up. A perfect example, we could say, of an unfulfilled desire. The previous video illustrates one of the issues that my practice tries to inspect. The role of objects, buildings, landscapes, and urbanisms in the construction of ideas as abstract as sovereignty or political identity. The projects that I will show in the next few minutes investigate how the conceptual, social, and material dimensions of uh, architecture and design are enmeshed within sociopolitical and national questions related to belonging, economic questions such as real estate, the regulation and normalization of bodies in scientific investigation, or notions of community in artistic institutions. How does architecture contribute to fulfill identity expectations? In 2014, together with Ignacio Galán, Carlos Minguez, Alejandra Navarrete, and Marina Otero, we won an international competition to curate the Oslo Architecture Triennale 2016. The structure of this triennale is quite unique and grants the curators almost three years uh, which they can devote to, to research. Those three years culminated with an event which had a rather long title. Well, the triennale was called After Belonging, a triennale in residence, on residence, and the ways we stay in transit. But what did we mean by after belonging? The global circulation of people, information, and goods has destabilized what we understand by residence, questioning notions of spatial permanence, property, and identity. More than uh, 240 million people are living today in a place where they were not born. In, 2000, uh, in 2019, sorry, the online retailing company Alibaba shipped 12, million, 12 billion sorry, packages to home addresses. The social media platform Instagram, uh, right now, if you check it out, has listed 58,940,079 posts stacked with the hashtag home. At present, it is estimated that more than, uh, uh, as I said, 200, uh, 200 uh, million people call home a place where they were not born. And for example, in a, in a European city, uh, in a European capital such as Oslo alone, uh, it's estimated that a 30% of the population uh, consists of uh, migrants. At the same time, the number of tourist arrivals throughout the world uh, stays, let's say, uh, that's, uh, that's calculated estimating stays of less than 12 months, is calculated to be over 1 billion. And in Norway alone, this, no this number, the number of tourists, is almost 5 million, which is roughly the same as the tourists, uh, sorry, as the country's stable population. Yes, circulation means greater access to further territories, as well as ever new, endlessly supplied commercial goods. But it's important to acknowledge that neither everybody nor everything circulate voluntarily, nor 
they do it in the same way. Circulation promotes human unsettlement and growing inequalities for large groups which are kept in precarious transit. Contemporary notions of belonging come to the fore in our very houses, which we have opened to unknown guests through sharing platforms, making, uh, making them part of a network of alike domestic spaces, no matter the social and cultural context in which they are located. They are actually all grouped under the same rubric, the rubric of the apparently welcoming rhetoric of the motto, belonging, belong, sorry, anywhere. Ultimately, being at home has different definitions nowadays, both within domestic settings, as well as in the spaces defined by national boundaries. Amidst this acceleration of circulation processes that I've just laid out, uh, the Triennale after belonging attempted to answer a double question. On the one hand, it aimed to analyze the ways in which architecture intervenes in our changing attachment to places and collectivities, that is, where do we belong? On the other hand, it inspected our relation to the objects and resources that we own, share, and exchange. How do we manage our belongings? Amongst many of the formats that uh, the event comprised, uh, the curatorial project took the form of two exhibitions, and here you can see one of them in residence. Um, the design basically uh, consisted of a dense space overlapping many information and objects. Uh, attempting, well, trying, uh, trying that visitors themselves make made their own connections between the different projects and took out their own conclusions. Amongst the projects that I would like to single out is the New World Embassy Rojava, conceived by Studio John Astal with the Kurdish communities of Rojava. This project was, without doubt, the participants' proposal which required the biggest curatorial effort, summing months of negotiations with several political and social institutions inside, inside and outside Norway. At a moment in which I would argue Triennales and Biennales fetishized the construction of real scape pavilions and follies, we decided to contribute to this collection of architectures in a very particular way. We did so through the construction of an embassy, which sought to problematize the notion of national architecture. In the image here, the image on the top, you can see the Oslo Town Hall, one of the most important modernist buildings in Oslo. Its construction works started in 1931. Uh, they were stopped during the Nazi occupation of the country, and they were resumed right after World War II. This building, though, is not only important in the context of Oslo itself, but bears a very important international symbolism. Each year, which is the image you can see on the bottom, its large public hall is closed off to host the award-winning ceremony of the Peace Nobel Prize, normally granted to individuals or organizations working to solve national or regional conflicts. This is the um, 2010 ceremony uh, granting the, the award, the Nobel Peace Award to uh, Ling Xiaobo. So for the closing weekend of the Triennale, Studio Jonas Tal with the Kurdish communities of Rojava set up the so-called New World Embassy Rojava, a temporary embassy installed in the Oslo City Hall that represented, through cultural means, the ideals of stateless, statelessness democracy developed by the democratic self-administration of the autonomous region of Rojava in northern Syria. That is, we built an embassy for a political community not recognized by most of the political actors in the international organisms, which normally recognize nation states, right? Um, and we did that in the very place where those actors yearly meet and celebrate certain diplomatic or activist figures, using architecture to highlight the inconsistencies between nation, state, and political representation. So John Stahl designed this sort of embassy, which kind of recalls the domes of many state parliaments that that he referred to it as an ideological planetarium. So the embassy operated for two consecutive days, bringing represented representatives from Rojava together with international politicians, diplomats, academic journalists, students, artists, many other professionals. Through the processes of open deliberation and public discussion that took place in this architecture within another architecture, the New World Embassy Rojava proposed a platform to build new transitional relations, new transnational, sorry, relationships and explore alternative models of people's diplomacy.
neix a les plantes perquè la gent que viu a la casa ha de continuar a mantenir-les i cuidar. Trades are important because these people work very generously to produce this video. Sorry, how does architecture contribute to fulfill the desires triggered by economic policies? Since 1985, Spain experienced a long-term increase of the economic value of real estate, which the construction industry, with the construction industry becoming the strongest economic sector in the country's GDP. For decades, the purchase of property and the construction of housing was promoted by the administration and private banks as one of the safest investor investments for moderately enriched middle-class citizens, what led to the outburst of suburban settlements throughout the territory. The so-called Spanish housing bubble collapsed in 2008. It led behind a huge housing stock which reflects the, soci the societal transformations of most of the country's population through the consolidation of a credit system and the emergence of diverse financial products. And I'm curious to know um, how, he thinks, uh, how he thinks that the model he was laying out yesterday applies to the Spanish model. The awareness of those, this socioeconomic context was critical in the refurbishment project of a damaged staircase in a very singular house located in Cardadeo, Barcelona, full of leaks and dampness. This project, called the Real Estate Boom House, explored the complicity of architecture in generating economic value and, subsequent, uh, and its subsequent bubbles. Economic value appears in here as the result of aesthetic propositions, of the economies and policies in which the real estate bubble was grounded, of the material processes that enabled the bubble itself, and as a result of the wish for a lifestyle, for lifestyle imaginaries that the bubble also promoted. Cardadeu, a town of 18,000 inhabitants located at, the, at 38 kilometers from Barcelona, experienced a significant suburban development during the Spanish real estate boom of the 1990s. At the time, new residential areas appeared amidst the vast crops surrounding the village. Amongst one of those new neighborhoods stands the house that I was asked to refurbish, adjacent to all, uh, four other units built by uh, the same promoter. This house could be considered paradigmatic of the architectures that the real estate boom in Spain promoted for at least three reasons, I would argue. First, the house original design, materials, and construction details rebuild the imaginaries of opulence that drove part of the real estate boom design in Spain. Uh, details which, in a way, were thought as increasing the property's market value and very fast. So before starting, uh, before taking any architectural decision, the first thing uh, I did is I went to interview the actual constructor and promoter of the house, which is that person there, which granted me permit to show his photograph. Um, and uh, he was very blunt in saying that he was actually testing details in his own garden in order to make the houses more unique and be able to increase their value, uh, and those are some of the pictures of the random constructions which appear uh, in his sort of like testing slash lab garden. Uh, you can see here behind, he did like a sort of mock-up of the Gherkin, uh, Foster's Gherkin building in like a Gaudi style. Um, second, second reason why this house is paradigmatic. The house can be considered paradigmatic because privileged views over the old town from the house's back facade at the edge of the suburban area and the adjacent cow fields are under continuous urbanization threat. Real estate booms, in fact, render the opportunities for construction infinite. There is no piece of land 
which is not capable of holding a building. And third, the boom's progression and lasting effects include several generations. This translates uh, into the housing, uh, well, these economic processes, let's say, uh, are done between at least three generations involving grandfathers, fathers, sons, uh, et cetera. This translates in a way into the house domestic interior, which attests to the radicality of the different generational sensitivities that have constituted the boom in Spain. In this image, for example, you see a Louis Poulsen metallic PH5 lamb, uh, which was given as a present to the owner of, owners of the house, juxtaposed to weaving work made by the owner to embellish the bed. Um, elements which, in a way, we can consider embodying different discourses on, on design. The intervention attempts to highlight these three idiosyncratic real estate conditions uh, that the house bears through a single operation. The staircase, which is the main piece which was asked to be restored, it was full of dampness, it has leaks, uh, some parts were kind of, kind of falling apart, is restored using craft techniques mixed with new technologies that aim to highlight the original materials and details. So ultimately what the strange details in the house uh, they were not, those were not erased, but somehow were revisited as if they documented the historical importance uh, as if they were representative of the culture of a specific period, the culture of the boom in Spain. So the intervention tries to rethink the staircase, uh, as I said uh, here, some drawings that we did at the very beginning. Uh, and I'll very fast walk you through the plans. Uh, the staircase was painted in pink to recontextualize the fake pink marble tiling grid which covers the floor throughout the house. Uh, we also designed special lamps for it. The blue Andalusian tiling in the hall was also restored and through the painting of certain surfaces it was turned into a sort of like tectonic, like this very disciplinary idea of the basement, the tectonic, the weight underneath uh, for the whole staircase volume. Th the second floor, this is how the staircase looks like. Uh, what was very important throughout the intervention is that there was this back and forth, this overlap between pre-existing ideas of design with new configurations, maintaining, when possible, a dialogue between both. Uh, this is a view of the lift of the staircase flight from the second to the third floor, and I think that those two things I'm going to explain now to finish. Uh, uh, very m miscalculated totally the time. Um, so the real estate boom in Spain produced a myriad of distinctive material details, as I explained, in order to appeal to the middle class. Amongst those details, it stands out the gotelé, which is this thing you can see on the top, a stipple paint technique meant to decorate walls in a sort of stylish um, upper class of look like. The clients, like the, the house was filled, covered with it, and the clients wanted this texture to be removed from the staircase, Mm, but first we thought that's an important element which is very definitory of what the house uh, was trying to say or do when it was originally built. So we did the casting of it, uh, double scale, we did a mall, double scale, and we did the casting of it and turned it into curtains to control the sun within the tower, which is this, which you can see here. Second thing which was uh, very important for us is that uh, the house in a way looks to rethink the techniques produced uh, during, uh, to, 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 to rethink these whole techniques I've been talking about to, to increase the value with other forms, unrecognized forms of architectural production. Um, for us, it was important to acknowledge that in the post-occupied house, there was another kind of detailing that coexisted with these architectural efforts that I've been talking about, which was precisely the, those efforts at economic revalorization of the house, and that is the ornamental weaving manufactured by the client herself. Textiles, and Amira talk about that, are a gendered form of labor, usually undervalued in male-centered architectural narratives. In the refurbishment of the house, I worked closely with the client on the production of a curtain prototype. The curtain was weaved using Castilian bobby lacing techniques, or encaje de bolillos, a quasi-algorithmic mode of human production. But with a turn, in a way we used the, we substituted tra the traditional cotton thread by this uh, fiber, and I'm finishing with this, sorry. Uh, this, is, this fiber is called Dyneema, and it's meant to be the strongest fiber in the world, basically born out of military research and primarily used in the production of ballistic helmets, vests, and shields. Uh, was here repurposed to, 
to strengthen an extremely fragile decorative element, allowing for its wider application in domestic design. This is how the, we did several trials and it was very exciting for us to photograph it with domestic elements like this, duality between the military and the domestic. This is basically how it looks like. We included a garden, technified garden, which controls the whole uh, air within it. It tells the clients when they have to water the plants. The plants are like sensitized. And we sort of invented this new garden, like because the garden behind of the house, when there is money in Spain, might disappear, as I've said, like booms consider that everything is sensitive to be urbanized. We thought of like, why don't we create a garden, a view in the top floor, which can be highly controlled and cannot be like constructed or erased. And that's basically it, because we like this appeal of like hiding a medieval, uh, within a medieval tower, sort of a very technological element, which filtrates aid. We decided to do this kind of mechanical louver, very Jean Nouvel in the Arab Institute, which worked just once, but that's okay. <laughs> And uh, this is actually how uh, the last floor looks. Okay. That's it. Yeah, thank you.